Well, welcome to the final uh, lecture in this year's series. After our most enjoyable diversion to sport and the law with Michael Beloff on the third lecture, we return to the broad theme of this year, which has been the relationship between the executive and the courts, and how good to see such a fine turnout today and a similar number, I know, online. And it is a great a pleasure and delight that we have to speak to us tonight the Right Honourable Dominic Grieve, King's Counsel, former Attorney General, to speak to us about the role of the Attorney General under his title, Lawyer or Politician, What is the Attorney General? Uh, he was a uh, Conservative MP for Beaconsfield from 1997 until 2019 had uh, a number of shadow front bench posts, including Attorney General and Home Secretary, in the years 1999 to 2010. And then, uh, with uh, Mr. Cameron's government, Attorney General from 2010 to 2014, and subsequently was Chair of the Intelligence and Security Committee from 2015 to 2019. And, of course, in 2019 was a particularly prominent uh, parliamentarian in the uh, events which culminated in the election of 2019. As I say, it is a delight that he's here. Thank you so much for crossing Little Temple Lane to join us today. And we greatly look forward to your lecture. Thank you for that kind introduction and thank you for the uh, invitation to come and join you uh, this evening. And it is actually quite a long time, rather a while, since I last spoke about the role of the Attorney General, which it was my privilege to um, hold the office for just over four years, four years and three months, I think, from 2010 to 2014, which for Attorneys General is probably a fairly good innings, as their careers often come to a premature end. <laughs> um, the... Um, Attorneys are rather silent figures. Indeed, it was always said that um, if the attorney got in the news, it was either because the government was in serious trouble or the attorney was in serious <laughs> trouble, or possibly uh, both. And I remember my slight sort of trepidation when I was tasked by the Cabinet Office. Um, attorneys don't write their memoirs, or at least I think there's an argument that they shouldn't, although they might be very interesting if I suppose they're kept in a locked chest for rather a long time. Um, but um, Lord Morris decided to defy that, and I was deputed by the Cabinet Office to talk to him, to try to discourage him from writing his memoirs, or at least to take out one or two bits which were thought to be uh, might stray into the area of client privilege. And, and I, I remember uh, being quite concerned about this, but we, we came to an amicable resolution uh, of the issue. So the attorney's role is really very varied. And that's really what I want to talk to you about tonight. Uh, I was going to do three things, or attempt to do three things. Firstly, to um, explain a bit about the history of the office and how it's evolved into its current form, because I think it's important to understand that if one is to understand how it works today. Secondly, explain what the role is at present. And I don't really think it's changed much in the nine years since I did it. Uh, the current Attorney General was my pupil, and I did consult her before giving uh, this talk. Uh, and therefore, I'm fairly reassured that nothing much has changed in terms of scope. And then, finally, last but not least, I thought we could have a debate around the role, um, including uh, looking at calls for change, of which there have been quite a few, and indeed criticisms of the way in which the office exists or the role is discharged. And then we can have a discussion. Uh, and at that point, you may conclude that as a politician, I have tried to avoid difficult areas, in which case you will doubtless raise them with me. History. Apart from the Lord Chancellor, the office, I think, looks to be the oldest in our governmental system. And it comes as absolutely no surprise that it first emerges with the development of our court system in the 13th century, in those immediate decades after Magna Carta in 1215. 
Now, those of you who know anything about medieval French history will know that in the 1240s, St. Louis, Louis IX of France, used to sit under an oak tree in the forest of Vincennes, dispensing justice to peasants who would come along and have royal justice dispensed for them. Uh, this would have been regarded, even in 1249 in England, as completely unacceptable. English kings could only dispense justice through their judges. And the reason for that was because kings had a partiality and an interest which they also needed to have represented. That's why, if you get prosecuted, it is R against somebody. Or, for that matter, if you have a judicial review in the High Court, it is the king on behalf of somebody against, sometimes, his own government. The role emerged because the king needed his interest to be represented in his courts. And the first person of whom we know anything doing this role was a man called Lawrence Del Brock, who appears in a record as receiving payment in 1243. Unclear whether he was actually the attorney general or was just a, essentially a sergeant at law who had been retained for those for a particular purpose. And not clear whether he had primacy. 1277 was a man called William de Bonneville, who definitely had a status of primacy. The attorney was therefore a court official. But by 1460s, we see the holder of the office being summoned to the House of Lords to advise not just the king, but also the Lords Spiritual and Temporal in Parliament assembled, more generally on legal matters. And there is, at about the same time, the first reference to the king's solicitor as his deputy, which by 1515 is described as a solicitor general and effectively the deputy to the attorney, although in early history with somewhat different functions. The first attorney, of whom we have a portrait, is a remarkable man called Sir James Hobart, who, unlike my office of four years and uh, three months, succeeded in holding his tenure from 1486 to 1509. He is shown on his knees, in prayer, wearing full plate armour, which is probably a very appropriate vision for the Attorney General's lot. In the 16th century, the role developed a mixture of prosecuting traitors and asserting monarchical prerogative and property rights, and advising uh, the government or the council of the monarch at the same time. While the Solicitor General started quite frequently to be a member of Parliament, the attorney, interestingly enough, remained a crown official, because, of course, he was essentially holding an office of profit under the crown. But things started to blur Francis Bacon in the early 17th century was both Attorney General and a Member of Parliament. The Commons didn't like it. They passed a resolution in 1614 that thereafter no Attorney General should at any time be of the House. But that sort of frittered away and by the end of the 17th century it had become not only conventional but also a requirement that the or a semi-requirement that the Attorney should also be a member of the House of Commons. He and the Solicitor General were turning less from counsel for the king and much more into the law officer of the government. Bacon, of course, was famously the person who said that the role was the painfulest task in the realm. The connection with the House of Lords also relaxed. Um, above, above all, the attorney turned into an advisor to government whilst at the same time keeping a practice at the bar, which could also be a personal practice. And that continued until the 1890s, when by agreement the attorney and the solicitor general ceased to have private practices. But they could still charge fees for the court work they did for the government, as well as essentially being paid a retainer for being the law officers. Uh, this was an arrangement which didn't appeal to Clem Attlee after the Second World War with the then Labour government. And Sir Hartley Shawcross then, with great skill, negotiated a package for the law officers, 
but made them salaried like any other ministers of the Crown, but on an entirely separate rate, so that the Attorney General was in fact paid more than any other minister save the Prime Minister and the Lord Chancellor. That happy situation continued until 2010, when I became Attorney General. <laughs> when um, the David Cameron decided that because of austerity, we should all take a pay cut. And it was pointed out perfectly fairly to me that if I didn't take a pay cut, I would be the most uh, well-paid minister in government. So since then, the attorney has taken the salary of a cabinet minister voluntarily, I did refuse to forfeit the actual rights negotiated by Hartley Shawcross, but that's what happened. And the Solicitor General is paid the salary rate of a Minister of State. The big change, though, that has happened really in the last 40 years is about the role of the law officers in respect of both the scale of their advisory work and the scale of their litigation work. Up to the 1980s, they had an enormous amount of work in court, although it could vary a little bit according to the taste of the law officer or the attorney concerned. Uh, they operated out of a tiny office, or two offices really, in the Royal Courts of Justice, uh, one of which provided office accommodation for the attorney and the solicitor, and the other one, there were four staffers who did all the work, and government advice would be rushed down in boxes down to the RCJ so that they could write up their advice to government whilst at the same time appearing in court. There's also an office in Parliament, which, in order to show the separation in our constitution, is entirely separate from the offices of other government ministers behind the Speaker's chair, is situated off the central lobby quite close to the House of Lords, where, of course, they also might have to appear as advocates, and there is a short corridor, law officers corridor, with offices for the attorney, the solicitor, and now the advocate general for Scotland. As I'll come on to explain in a minute, the volume of other responsibilities now makes court work in practice quite difficult to juggle with the other duties for the attorney, and the attorney general has many more staff. My office was in Victoria Street in a small and rather mean modern office block. Um, it's now in the Justice Ministry building, but um, I am reassured to hear uh, from the current attorney that it is entirely separate from it and requires a separate pass key in order to gain access. I will return to that issue a little bit later in respect of the predatory desires of successive justice ministers to absorb the law officers into their departments. Although of cabinet rank, and that is an issue which attorneys have had to fight for, there was an attempt actually when I took office to say that we should only, I should only have a Minister of State salary and that Edward Garnier should only have a parliamentary undersecretary. And we both said that that was absolutely fine by us, but we wouldn't do the job. <laughs> um, the attorney is not a member of the cabinet. He may attend it, and I will come back to that later, but he is its advisor. Now, actually, in history, there has been a very short period when the attorney did become a member of the cabinet. That happened in 1910, when Rufus Isaacs was so miffed at not being made Lord Chancellor at that stage that, as a solace, um, he was made a full member of the cabinet. Um, that continued until 1924, when Patrick Hastings found himself embroiled in a terrible row when it was alleged that he had been lent on by his cabinet colleagues to drop a prosecution for sedition against the editor of the Daily Worker, who was encouraging um, soldiers to mutiny, or at least not to serve. Um, actually, though Patrick Hastings had behaved perfectly properly, but it led to the fall of the Labour government, and about four years later, uh, the Conservative government decided to drop any idea of the Attorney General being a full Cabinet member and therefore within the collective responsibility of the Cabinet. That is, in brief, a short history of the attorney's, uh, how the Attorney's role has developed. But what does the Attorney General really do today? First, and I think which has to emphasise this, 
some key aspects of the historic role are very much present. Although the attorney is appointed by the prime minister, and he can be fired by the prime minister, as I discovered, so, um, the, prime Min the attorney is the sovereign's attorney general, not the prime minister's attorney general. The oath of office remains that set down in the middle of the 16th century and is taken, and it's quite an intimidating occasion, in front of the Lord Chief Justice and all the other judges who are available assembled in the Lord Chief Justice's court. And it's the same for the Solicitor General. The oath is actually probably worth reading out because although it is archaic, it's quite revealing about the duties of the attorney and the solicitor. And it says this, I do declare that well and truly I will serve the Queen, it was for me, as her attorney general in all her courts of record within Great Britain, and truly counsel the Queen in her matters when I shall be called and duly and truly minister the Queen's matters and sue the Queen's process after the course of the law and after my cunning. Cunning is in the 16th century rather than the Blackadder sense. That is to say, um, wisdom. For any matter against the Queen, where the Queen is a party, I will take no wages or fee of any man. I will duly and in convenient time speed such matters as any person shall have to do in the law against the Queen, as I may lawfully do without long delay, tracting or tarrying the party of his lawful process in that that to me belongeth. And I will be attendant to the Queen's matters when I shall be called there too. And I think the interesting thing about this is that firstly it's the emphasis that the attorney has got to devote himself completely to the Queen's matters. Secondly that he mustn't take bribes and thirdly and I think it's quite interesting because it's state out of articles 39 and 40 of Magna Carta that he shouldn't abuse his position to prevent any other person getting justice including against the sovereign themselves because it's absolutely clearly set out. And I've always had an argument with Lord Sumption about this, because he claims that Magna Carta went out of fashion. But as this was a 16th century oath, I think its echo is still very much present. Um, it's possible that the attorney could be called on to advise the sovereign personally on issues that relate to the sovereign's public functions. Alone, along with the prime minister, the attorney has to ask permission to take a holiday and leave the realm, and you have to write to the king or queen's private secretary uh, to do that. And fortunately, one always worried, it was never refused, but I did worry slightly of a letter back saying, Her Majesty has noticed the attorney's been away quite a lot recently, but it didn't happen. Patrick Mayhew, one of my predecessors, said of the attorney general that he owes first a loyalty to the sovereign, secondly to the law, and thirdly to his colleagues in government. And Harold Macmillan told Peter Rawlinson something rather similar when he said Crown, Parliament, Administration in that order. I actually don't see a great difference between those, between law and Parliament. So I think you can run them together. He's appointed under the Great Seal. And fascinatingly, when I was appointed and was handed my Great Seal parchment, accompanying it was a funny little piece of paper folded like a piece of origami which um, summoned me personally to the House of Lords. I said, is this a mistake? And he said, no, 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 this relates back to your being summoned as an advisor to the House of Lords. But don't worry, attorney, no one has ever asked any attorney recently to do anything. In fact, when I was attorney general, I did have to advise the House of Lords about whether lords could be stripped of their peerages. To do the work... The attorney and the solicitor have a small department. When I was there, we were 42, of whom there were 17 lawyers, brought in from elsewhere in government, and our director, who was also a government lawyer. Um, the current one was, in fact, my foreign affairs adv legal advisor when I was there. The numbers had peaked under Labour because Peter Goldsmith had tried to turn the attorney's office into a small policy-making department with considerable ambitions under what's called the trilateral relationship, working with the Justice Minister Secretary and the Home Secretary. 
Um, I decided we were far too small a fish in a big pond to have any impact. And whilst the attorney has a role in the development of criminal justice policy, a very key one, I decided that the policymakers were in fact not particularly helpful to delivering that. So we came down from 56 to 42, which pleased the Treasury, who were trying to encourage us to make some cuts. Essentially, nowadays, the Solicitor General is a deputy of the attorney. They have no separate functions. The workload is shared. The work is allocated out between the two of them. Uh, they have offices adjacent to each other. They work together and hopefully talk together and cooperate well together in a good relationship. In the case of Lord Garnier now, Edward Garnier and Oliver Heald, very good working relationships. But ultimately, it's the attorney, I suppose you could say, who gets the bigger stuff. And it's the attorney who is seen as being the senior. Behind that small office, there are two, around 2,000 lawyers. I'm told, actually, the figure's gone down to 1,800. In the government legal service, embedded in government, with a treasury solicitor in charge. A treasury solicitor is the permanent secretary of the attorney general, but he is not co-located with the Attorney General at all. The relationship between the Attorney and the Treasury Solicitor is an immensely important one. I used to meet fortnightly for breakfast with the Treasury Solicitor, then Sir Paul Jenkins and then Sir Jonathan Jones, in order to gossip. <laughs> also, my business was to visit lawyers in their departments, check they were happy, and to be an ultimate point of reference in event of their being any unhappy with the way they were being treated within the individual departments where they were working. The attorney also has, for the solicitor, the political superintendents of the Director of Public Prosecutions. And alongside that, the Crown Prosecution Service, the Serious Fraud Office, and the Director of Service Prosecutions. I don't know exactly what the figures for that are, but that's probably around five to 6,000 people working in government. And I'll come back to that a little bit later. The first, and without doubt the most important aspect, is about advising government. Now, how's that actually done? Most advice, of course, mercifully, doesn't have to come from the attorney at all, but from those lawyers in government who are embedded there. But the Cabinet Manual and the Ministerial Code make clear that matters which have a reputational impact on government or involve disputes between departments or where there appears to be difficulty or uh, in ascertaining exactly what the law is have to come and be escalated to the law officers. Those will come in to the law officers' department where the lawyers who have actually usually worked in those departments previously, look at it and prepare a dossier which they present to one or other of the law officers explaining their own take on the legal problem. And it is up to the attorney and the solicitor general whether they endorse it or substitute their own view. If there is areas of difficulty, often the first thing you do is to call a conference with the staffers concerned and quite frequently, if it is complex, go out and get outside advice. Usually Treasury Council, led by the Treasury Devil, still James Eady after all these years, or somebody else with a specialism. But you can go elsewhere if you want. Um, since leaving office, I've heard rather to my horror Sometimes it being described that the Attorney General is the minister in government who commissions advice. Well, all I can say is that if that is how some attorneys have been viewing it, it's not constitutional, because it's absolutely clear that at the end of the day, the letter that goes out in the name of the attorney or solicitor is their advice, not somebody else's. By convention, the fact that the attorney has or hasn't advised is never disclosed, nor the content, although there have been some exceptions. Lord Goldsmith's advice on Iraq did eventually see the light of day. And, of course, Geoffrey Cox, one of my successors, found himself the subject of a humble address by the House of Commons that forced his advice to Theresa May, the Prime Minister, on how the Northern Ireland Protocol would work in practice, or her Northern Ireland Protocol, not the later one, um, forced its revelation. 
I should make clear, I actually vote, uh, spoke and voted against doing that because in my judgment, the attorney's advice is routinely revealed. It's going to cause really serious problems as it would actually in any relationship between client and lawyer. Attorneys are there to apply the test of respectable legal argument where the law is uncertain, particularly with international law, which as you'll appreciate, although there are international tribunals, but in many cases, it isn't, uh, it's not open to any judicial interpretation. The reality is that most of the diet of work being done by the law officers concerns foreign affairs and treaties, constitutional and devolution issues, EU law in the past, and probably still at the moment, and important human rights and ECHR and Human Rights Act considerations. In addition to that, there's an absolute central principle that the attorney, in terms as a litigator, particularly in instructing Treasury Council, and I used to say this when I used to go and address the new Treasury Council on the list, is that the duty of candour and the duty to advance proper arguments in court in defending the government's position has to take precedence with just wanting to win a case. Central to the role of the attorney that the integrity of the government's legal positions is maintained at all times. Again, I'll come back to that. To do the work, the attorney goes to Cabinet by invitation. Now, this has been a long saga. Uh, Patrick Mayhew used to say it was important the attorney shouldn't always go to Cabinet to emphasise his separate role. What I certainly found was that the Prime Minister would invite me to some Cabinet meetings, but not to others in the first six months I was in office. I would then get a copy of the Cabinet minutes and immediately notice that there was something was discussed where I ought to have been there and point it out. The consequence was that actually the attorney, at the end of it, was attending every cabinet meeting. But in attending cabinet meetings, I would sit silently down at one end of the table, usually exchanging private jokes with the note taker who used to sit next to me about some of the things that were going on. And I certainly tried to avoid participation unless I had something to say concerning the legal issues that might come under consideration. But it's really helpful for the Attorney General to be present because otherwise he doesn't necessarily have his finger on the pulse of what's going on. And one of the things I used to find as attorney is I'd be stopped in the corridor outside by a colleague who'd start talking to me about some huge legal problem, uh, imagining that just because he'd instructed his officials that morning to send it to the attorney's office, I would know all about it. But at least it gave me a heads up of what the problems were that might be coming down the track. Um, The attorney also has a specific role in relation to the introduction of any legislation uh, into Parliament. Before legislation comes in, it has to go before a legislative committee that meets in an airless room under the Chamber of the House of Commons, chaired by the Leader of the House, and the department that is sponsoring the bill produces a uh, brief and vouches for the bill being ready points out if it has any unusual powers or retrospective effects and vouches for its certificate of compliance with the European Convention on Human Rights. Uh, But the attorney has to approve that. And um, if the attorney is not satisfied, he will turn up along with the Solicitor General and should say so, in which case back to the drawing board and it may delay the introduction of the legislation. Law officers also play a role sometimes in the passage of legislation on the floor of the House. They may sponsor a bill if, for example, it concerns the Crown Prosecution Service. And in addition to that, they may sometimes sit in on a complex piece of legislation in order to advise the House if issues are raised in course of debate as to what they think the answer might be. The attorney can also be an advisor to the House of Commons as long as there's no conflict of interest between the interests of the Commons, and the interests of his role in government. Usually that means giving advice to the Standards and Privileges Committee, but it can also involve a a legal query, as I said, in the House on a bill. It's a matter, as I said earlier, of choice as to whether law officers go into court or not. Some law officers have in recent times, particularly solicitors general, been solicitors and have simply not done so. 
Most attorneys have sought to do it, having been barristers, but it's really a matter of personal choice. I think I expressed it in the way that, as I was a barrister, I felt I jolly well ought to do some cases, and there are occasionally cases which are sufficiently high profile that there is a sense of obligation that it is the attorney who should go into court if he feels competent and capable of doing the representation. What that amounted to for the government in my time in office was appearing in a case called Chester and McGeeck, which was about European Union law and prisoner voting, which was a matter of huge controversy and massive concern for the then Prime Minister, David Cameron, who was incredibly anxious that the case might lead to our being compelled to change the law on prisoner voting by European Union law, rather than the problem that we already had, which was that we were in breach of a judgment of the European Court of Human Rights. And I was very fortunate to be able to win that case for him, and he has seemed to be very grateful. The other one was the Agricultural Wages Bill Wales, which I referred to the Supreme Court in my capacity of the public interest rather than the government's interest, because there was an issue of doubt as to whether agricultural wages were employment law and therefore reserved, or agriculture and therefore uh, devolved, and I lost the case. I went to do a case in the Court of Human Rights concerning prisoner voting and an intervention called Scopola, and a very interesting case on visas in the European Court of Justice. All that keeps the law officers pretty busy. Um, I think it probably takes up about 60% of their time. The second role is the superintendents as a departmental minister of the Crown Prosecution Service, the SFO, and the Service Prosecuting Authority. That means negotiating their budgets with the Treasury, meeting regularly with their heads, discussing the effectiveness of the service and major cases that might cause wider public or parliamentary interest, save if it involves a fellow parliamentarian, in which case under the conventions which operate, the law officers have absolutely nothing to do with it. You visit the offices where the work is done, discuss the work with the staff and encourage them, try to provide general political leadership. But although nominally the DPP and the director of the SFO and service prosecutions are the appointment and indeed in a sense the agents of the attorney, the reality is that the attorney, they are independent players and the attorney is there to protect them from political interference. The attorney general has significant reserve powers of interference in prosecution including directing a prosecution potentially or putting in a nulli prosequi. But since the Brown reforms of 2007-8, again, to which I will touch on in a moment, um, the attorney, there is a protocol by which the Attorney General will not interfere except in cases of national security. And that may sound odd, but they do arise. Just to give an example, Peter Rawlinson, when he was Attorney General, there was a hijacking or attempted hijacking of a plane by a Palestinian called Leila Khaled, who was overpowered and arrested and taken to Heathrow Police Station and charged with air piracy. Three other planes were then hijacked and taken to Jordan. And the question as to whether Leila Khaled should be exchanged for the people who were in the planes in Jordan, the only person who could take that decision was the attorney because the attorney had to decide whether to discontinue the prosecution and for her to be released. It couldn't be done by anybody else. And that's why the national security issue, I think, remains a valid area for the attorney's intervention. The attorney has by statute to provide consent to certain prosecutions. He has to act quasi-judicially in doing that to ensure that the public interest is being served, not somebody else's interest. There were 42 acts listed in 2018 where there are prosecutions which can be brought which require his consent. And amazingly, there's also 72 need the DPP and 10 need the, either the attorney or the DPP or a secretary of state. The truth is it's a complete hodgepodge. Obscenity, trade union law, official secrets, national security, they're all examples of where Parliament has been anxious about giving a prosecutorial power and has therefore entrusted it, the attorney, to be the ultimate arbiter. But on the face of it, it would be a very strange thing indeed if the attorney were not to give consent, 
For what it is right to say is that there were examples in my time where having been asked to give consent, I spoke to the Crown Prosecutor and said, are we really sure that this is a prosecution that we should be bringing? And the prosecutor, having reflected on it, said, I agree with you that I don't think we should. But I never had to exercise any override. But it's there. It's an ability to look at what is going on uh, and to try to make a sensible judgment on it. Um, the consequence of that is that um, the attorney sometimes has to give consent in some very odd places. I certainly gave one consent standing on top of a mountain in Scotland. Uh, but it all depends when the, the limitation period on people, uh, people being detained in custody is about to run out. Um, so, and as I say, it's also true that anyone can write to the attorney about a prosecution. And you used to get lots of letters from private individuals, uh, whether consent required or not. And again, the attorney could look at it if he thought it was worthwhile and might pick up the query if he thought that for some reason justice wasn't being done. The attorney can issue guidelines after uh, consultation with the DPP and others, disclosure guidelines for prosecutors, and the attorney meets regularly with the Lord Chief Justice to discuss concerns of senior judiciary about the functioning of the criminal justice system. Finally, in this list, and I apologise for it being so long, but that's what the job entails, the attorney has a multitude of functions as guardian of the public interest in support of the rule of law and the operation of the courts. These are supposed to be done entirely independently of political colleagues. I'm not going to list them all, but there are just a few. Par to refer certain unduly lenient sentences to the Court of Appeal. An important power, but again one which should not be abused. When I was in office, the view was that if we were re referring more than 100 cases a year, we should be worried about it. And also that if we didn't have an 80% success rate, we should be worried about it. It should not be a mechanism by which the law officers pass on to the Court of Appeal uh, difficult cases where, in fact, the judge has passed an appropriate sentence. Dealing with vexatious litigants, getting an inquest verdict quashed and a fresh inquest ordered. I did that with Hillsborough, helped by the very good inquiry carried out by Bishop Jones of Liverpool, and then went to the High Court to get the original inquest verdict quashed. And then, of course, there was a completely fresh inquiry with very different outcome. And I didn't do it in the case of David Kelly, suicide, in the arms to Iraq, where Lord Hutton had conducted an earlier inquest, because having reviewed it, I concluded that the evidence that Professor Kelly had killed himself, Dr. Kelly had killed him, was overwhelming. But I sought, firstly, to make a statement in the House of Commons, and secondly, to put in the, uh, the library of the House a detailed schedule trying to go through every single assertion that had been made by people who were concerned at what had happened to explain why, on each case, my conclusion was that there was nothing to be reviewed. The attorney can intervene in certain proceedings to protect charities, and the attorney has a duty to bring proceedings for contempt of court against newspapers or individuals who commit breaches of the Contempt of Court Act 1981. In my case, that was probably the most controversial and difficult area I had to operate in, because in my predecessor's time, they'd given up on bringing prosecutions under the Contempt of Court Act, as a consequence of which the newspapers were writing anything they liked about uh, defendants, particularly at the time of arrest, uh, safe in the belief that it would have no impact on the trial process. There was some evidence that it was beginning to have exactly that. And so I was perhaps fortunate that there was a rather sensational case in which the Mirror and the Sun misbehaved very badly in that on the arrest of a a man called Christopher Jeffries for the alleged murder of a lady called Joanna Yates. Um, they published lurid stories about him, which he subsequently recovered very substantial li libel damages, uh, alleging that he had a macabre interest in death because he was a teacher at school teaching English and read the poetry of uh, Christina Rossetti. <laughs> um, all this came out over a new year. In fact, he wasn't the murderer. It was a lodger called Mr. Tabak who was eventually convicted, and I prosecuted both newspapers for this, which they didn't like at all, 
But I did it whilst at the same time going to a lot of effort to go out and speak to the Society of Editors and tell them that there was a perfectly clear framework within which they could operate, but they could not transgress it. And it seems to have worked reasonably well, something which gave me very considerable pleasure. Less pleasure was having to prosecute jurors for contempt of court, a problem which um, intends, in my experience, to have come as a result of the existence of social media and the ability to carry out internet research, in which is now, uh, it's now been converted slightly, so the attorney no longer has to do it. And then finally in this list, the attorney is um, the Advocate General for Northern Ireland. My predecessors were attorneys for Northern Ireland before the separate judicial system was set up and used actually to go over there for about two days a month, an extremely onerous burden. I found, and I think my successors have found, that there is much more limited work, that there are still reserved areas that the attorney has to advise on. And finally, the attorney is nominally, at any rate, the leader of the bar. Um, I and I think my two solicitors, uh, Edward Garnier and Oliver Heald, did our best to attend bar council meetings. I found a rather interesting document which suggested our attendance was considerably higher than has happened subsequently, which gives me some pleasure. <laughs> but there was a purpose to it, which was that you are there to listen to what the bar is saying, not because you're providing leadership in the sense of what the chairman of the bar is doing, but because you are there to act as a bridge between the profession and government. Now that covers, I think, the outline. I now want to turn, not, not, hope, not too lengthily, to the controversy. The attorney's role has always attracted controversy and most centres on the fact that people don't like decisions that attorneys make and then allege that the reason why the attorney has made that decision is because he's a politician and not a lawyer and has done it for political reasons. So ever since the last 30 years, there have been calls for the role to be changed. Effectively, that the political aspect of the work affects the professional judgment and that there should be changes which would effectively remove or perhaps the attorney would cease to be a politician and solely be a lawyer. Matters came to a head in the early 2000s following, firstly, Lord Goldsmith's advice on the Iraq war. Secondly, cash for honours in which Lord Goldsmith got enmeshed uh, in the sense that he pointed out that he couldn't resile from his duty in considering the issues in cash for honours uh, at that time, including whether the Prime Minister might be prosecuted. And thirdly, the BAE bribery scandal, uh, where it was alleged that he had intervened and put pressure on the director of the Serious Fraud Office to drop an investigation. Some radical ideas were then put forward, and it was all considered by the Constitutional Affairs Committee of the, uh, 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 of the time. That was that essentially the DPP should be carved out as a completely separate role, as in Northern Ireland, answerable if to anybody, possibly to the Justice Secretary, in a very vague way, but otherwise a completely independent player. The rest of the role should then be given to an experienced independent lawyer able to advise the government. The example was made of the Lord Advocate and the way his, her role has developed in Scotland. Tending cabinet if necessary, with an office, but a civil servant and not a politician. Uh, but at the end of all that, there was the view that that should not take place. And instead, there were some very modest reforms, uh, namely that um, the, uh, there was the protocol to try to remove the attorney as much as possible from prosecutorial decisions and to make clear that the DPP and the director of the SFO and of the Service Prosecution Authority were in fact very light touch when it came to any superintendents. The view was then that the range of roles was seen not as a weakness, but as a strength, as the status of the attorney as a senior practicing lawyer in government and parliament aided understanding of the prosecution authorities and helped guide their direction, 
and also helped ensure that there was someone in government who provides an understanding of why the government needs to respect and uphold the rule of law, particularly following the significant changes that have taken place in the role of the Lord Chancellor. Now, I just digress for a moment. The Lord Chancellor's role has changed dramatically in the last 25 years, from being essentially a figure, judicial figure in government, uh, to being a minister, and sometimes a minister on the career make. And despite the oath of office, which was introduced by the House of Lords deliberately to require respect for the rule of law, it's right to say that as a result of those changes, the burden for explaining the rule of law has probably fallen at times far more heavily on the law officers than it did previously. Although in truth, that is not the law officer's function. The law officer's function is, of course, to respect the rule of law and as lawyers to practice professionally in the respect of the rule of law, but not to act as a sort of lecturer to government about its obligations. Lord Wolfe in 2007 took the view. He said this, like the Lord Chancellor, the Attorney General is part of the glue that holds the Constitution together. At present, he's a means of communication between the judiciary and the government, and at a time when the other constitutional changes are taking place, it would be well not to interfere with this historic office. Certainly the case that as a result of what happened then, and speaking for myself, um, I saw it as my role when I was attorney to try to be seen at all times as independent and resolutely professional. That doesn't mean seeking to undermine the government. The role of the Attorney General is to find ways for the government to achieve its goals by lawful means. But it is right to point out that um, in the course of that, I did fall out with the then Prime Minister over the Human Rights Act, not because he was wishing to act unlawfully, but he wished to embark on a policy change that, in my view, was incoherent unless it involved withdrawal from the ECHR itself and would lead to illegality if it was pursued otherwise. I think my immediate successor, Jeremy Wright, continued very much in the same style. Geoffrey Cox, who followed, I think also did, but he was far more willing to step into the political arena. You may remember he acted as the warm-up act for Theresa May <laughs> at a party conference and also, I think, acted possibly slightly reluctantly as the warm-up act of Boris Johnson's leadership bid <coughs> in the summer of 2019. After that, of course, we had uh, Swella Brabham, whose legal interpretations appeared to be at least, I think it's fair to say, heavily influenced by her political views, including a belief that international legal obligations could be subordinated to parliamentary sovereignty, when in fact the duty falls on government and not on parliament, and the wrong is in parliament conniving, well, government conniving with parliament or inciting parliament to break an international legal obligation to which the government has signed up. It was also apparent, and you can't escape it, in the fact that she made references to the Court of Appeal for unduly lenient sentences in cases where, in the words of the Court of Appeal, they were unconventional, in the words, in the quote, in that it was an exercise in political polemic. The Court said it was regrettable that in advancing her submissions, the structure and ambit of the guideline wasn't addressed. That's the sentencing guideline. Nor was any sufficient explanation given why it's contended that the judge was not merely entitled to depart from the guideline, but was positively required to do so. This was in respect to the manslaughter of a police officer, where she sought to get the sentence very significantly increased and failed. And the other big change has been that Swella Braverman, when a, a Attorney General, for the first time had a political advisor something which I remember Sir Paul Jenkins uh, telling me when I was appointed in 2010 was, and when it was being suggested to me by number 10 Downing Street, completely unacceptable, which I agreed with. Uh, she, in fact, shared that advisor with Lord Frost. Mm. The um, 
I, I, so I didn't need any persuading. I understand that the compromise that's now been reached is that the present Attorney General doesn't have a special advisor, but there is a special advisor in number 10 who acts as a liaison with uh, the law officers. It's been pointed out in recent times that the talent pool in Parliament for the roles of Attorney General and Solicitor General is diminishing. Between 1997 and 2015, barristers made up 5% of the House of Commons, whereas between 1951 and 1974, it was 15%, and the vast majority of those were silks of considerable experience. That, as a consequence, means that whereas most attorneys used to be silks of at least five or even ten years standing, now with the ex recent ex exception of Geoffrey Cox, they've taken silk on appointment or on appointment as Solicitor General. And I have to accept that in my case, I'd only been in silk two years when I became attorney. So we shouldn't be surprised, I think, that the issue has now come back again. Indeed, if those of you are interested... There is a paper that has been recently written in the Cambridge Legal Studies, essentially going back to some of the things that were being said in 2007. And the House of Lords Constitution Committee has recently looked at the issues. Um, so I think that this matter is probably going to be around again for some time. I can only give you my personal view. I think that if we were to move to a system where the attorney is a civil servant... I think that civil servant would be at a considerable disadvantage. Provided you have an attorney general who understands what the rule of law is and the duties of the law officers, then in actual fact, he or she is likely to have far more capacity to influence colleagues and understand their concerns than somebody who's been brought in from outside. And the reality is that if at the end of the day a law officer feels so constrained by what the government is doing that he wishes she or she wishes to resign, they are in a position to stand up in the House of Commons and explain, or the House of Lords if they're there, to explain why. Whereas a civil servant with a duty of confidentiality is likely to simply have to disappear. That's effectively what's happened to Sir Jonathan Jones when he went over the Internal Markets Bill. Uh, and it's, what happened, uh, it, it's what's happened in the past on a number of occasions with Foreign Office legal advisers. So I think the politician has more clout than the civil servant. But that said, the politician has to be able to understand what the duties of the attorney are all about. And I'm confident with my pupil, the current attorney general... Uh, that she knows that very well indeed. Thank you all very much for listening. I'm very happy to have a discussion. Well, thank you for that fascinating talk. And I have to have questions from the floor here and also I'll be keeping an eye online. Yes, there's a, there's a microphone to go around. Thank you very much for that uh, fine lecture. Considering this morning a foreign secretary was appointed who's not in parliament at all, but you're keen to maintain the political character of the attorney general, could a compromise position be experienced but nonetheless political members of the bar could be appointed to that role without being sitting members of parliament, cutting off their practice early, having less experience in the courts? Well, uh, just to take up the first bit, the Foreign Secretary is, in fact, I think, a Member of Parliament because he will be introduced out this into the House of Lords sometime this week. I see Lord Hunt nodding in the front row. It may even be tomorrow morning, for all I know, accelerated. <laughs> he will be there. He cannot hold office without being answerable to one or other of uh, the Houses of Parliament. Um, in the past, Labour have tended to solve this problem when they were in office under Tony Blair by appointing actually rather experienced lawyers to the House of Lords. Um, and I actually think that worked pretty well. If you don't have a lawyer of the right experience available in the Commons, you can put them in the Lords, and they are answerable in the Lords. Now, it's true that it does put them at a slight disadvantage. 
I think Edward Garnier and I and Oliver Heald and I both agree because we were Commons appointees after a period where we'd had Baroness Scotland, Lord Goldsmith, and indeed all the predecessors back under Labour were, as attorney, were peers. That there were significant advantages of having the Attorney General in the House of Commons, and that's historically where it was. But I do accept that it is becoming harder. Um, lots of lawyers are reluctant to give up on substantial practices in order to go into the House of Commons. Uh, Geoffrey Cox is perhaps the exception because he went into the House of Commons and didn't give up his very substantial <laughs> practice. <laughs> but it, it, it probably had, well, it didn't prevent him becoming attorney, but I think it was seen as having a negative effect on any other career ambitions that he might have. Um, but that having been said, um, if the talent pool in the Commons isn't there, I would go to the Lords. But I would still take the view that the attorney needs and the law officers generally need to be part of the system, part of the political system. And indeed their ability, as I was trying to explain, to act as a restraint on their colleagues is, I think, enhanced by the fact that they are one of them, if it works properly. As you may have noted from one or two things I've said, I, I think that under Suella Braverman, you could argue that this wasn't happening, that her political views were so dominant over her legal perspective as to cause quite serious and significant problems. And if that is where we're going, then I would probably have to concede that we would probably be better off with, um, with, with appointed lawyers. But they will be civil servants. And they certainly, in those circumstances, couldn't be recruited for a political preference. Um, they would have to be appointed under the normal system for senior appointments in government, which is an appointments committee, uh, just as you appoint the DPP today. So, I, 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 and, and who would have the input? That's the other question I raise. Who is the minister who would have input into that? I, I fear it would be the justice minister. Um, the, um, when I was talking earlier, there have been at various times since the creation of the Ministry of Justice suggestions that when it, when it was made, the suggestion was being made to Edward Garnier and I that we should become, he, I a Minister of State rank and he a Parliamentary Under Secretary, what was being suggested is that we should be found nice cosy office in the Justice Ministry. And that's why we both said, well, that's all very interesting, but we will not do this job. Uh, it was a momentary passing blip in the first week in our taking office in 2010. But it was interesting that somebody clearly had it in a bottom drawer and had been sort of thinking that this was a really good idea. And we just had to say no, and then it disappeared. There's one question here from... Uh online, a former legal academic now on a barrister course. Is it within the duties of the Attorney General to help uphold international obligations? Yes, it certainly is, because the ministerial code makes absolutely clear, or at least it used to make it totally clear until David Cameron changed it. Um, it used to say that ministers had a duty to respect the law, rule of law, including the United Kingdom's international legal obligations. Um, Cameron then took it out of the ministerial code. The argument was that, um, well, it wasn't very clear why he took it out, but I think he probably took it out because he'd been reminded about this a couple of times too often by me. Um, <laughs> and, and, and he took it out, and then somebody said they're going to bring a judicial review, whereupon the government conceded immediately that the fact it had been taken out made absolutely no difference to the obligation. So the obligation is there. And because the obligation is there, it is the duty of the attorney to protect that obligation because it would be a breach of the code. And what happened with the Internal Markets Bill, and I wasn't privy to the discussions which took place, which led to resignations, the resignation of Lord Keane as Advocate General for Scotland, the resignation of Jonathan Jones, I think probably the resignation of Mark Sedwell effectively, or at least his departure, I think when you read between the lines. But effectively, a situation was arrived at where advice was being given to government to justify doing something which the ministerial code says can't be done. So, um, yes, it is undoubtedly the duty of the Attorney General to see that the ministerial code is observed. 
Now, obviously, countries can decide to rip up their international legal obligations. You know, Germany, when it uh, invaded Belgium in 1914, said its treaty of guaranteeing Belgian neutrality was a scrap of paper. But that isn't the UK's approach, particularly as we're signed up to around 14,000 international treaties. We are probably the biggest treaty-making power in world history. And one of the foundations of the way the UK operates is to say that we will observe our international legal obligations. And not just the ones where there are arbitral mechanisms for resolving disputes, because, of course, that will end up in a court somewhere, but even the ones where you just have to do the interpretation. That doesn't mean to say it's sometimes not always easy. It can be quite difficult at times. So some things are grey areas, and occasionally you also get treaties which are obsolete. Nobody's observing them anymore. 110 years old, and nobody is... <laughs> And you have to decide, is it permissible to do something which are technically is in breach when nobody has any interest or concern for this treaty, but it hasn't been formally revoked. So there are some quite interesting issues that can arise. But the basic message must be that the attorney is there for the government to observe the law. Question there, right? Yes. Mr. Dominic Green, I had known you for a long time. And uh, obviously, you are very formidable speaker and parliamentarian. And they stopped your career when you were attorney general and you could not move. But this morning, this shuffle this morning, is a good opportunity for one nation conservatives. And so those who are following you later on, they will have a good chance. Is this a political, but, political but I'm question. not going to ask the, uh, about the attorney general's role, mm. uh, but uh, you have proved that you have been a sovereign attorney general. That's the role that you played. But I'm speaking on behalf of the lot of Commonwealth students here, uh, and I became a, I came as a as a member of the Windrush generations yeah. to build the Britain. So on behalf of them, what I'm saying, trying to say about the lawyer and politicians, that all the post-colonial independence leaders of the Commonwealth of the East such as Gandhi or Nehru from India, Jinnah of Pakistan, Tunku Abdurrahman from Malaysia, Solomon Bandanayaka of Sri Lanka, Ceylon, and Lee Kuan Yew, Singapore, were all barristers of Inner Temple, mainly Middle Temple and Lincoln Zin. They are all successfully laid the foundation of democratic states in their country. So there is a big impetus for my, those who are students here from the inner temple. Therefore, my question is not against, about the uh, role of the attorney general in this country, because I have seen in Commonwealth, they have by, they have number of different way they are doing the, the attorney general's position. My question is, it appears that all qualified barristers and lawyers are best equipped to run the democratic nation, since it is based on rule of law independence of judiciary and human rights. Right. And that is the best. Thank, and thank you very, look thank at you. the London event, see Margaret Thatcher versus <laughs> Boris Johnson. I think we got Gordon. the question. I, 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 I think I got yeah. Well, the, the, the answer is I think lawyers in parliament and lawyers in government are important, although I also have to say that I think if we were all lawyers in parliament and all lawyers in government, it would be pretty awful as well. <laughs> uh, so I, I, think, I, think, I think we are, we, we, we do have a role to play, and I entirely accept that. As for the bit about the Commonwealth, I, I, perhaps I should have added, the attorney does network quite heavily with, um, with Commonwealth uh, attorneys. Uh, there's also the Five Eyes relationship, which brings together an annual conference of the attorneys of the US, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and the UK, uh, which is a very important gathering to discuss issues of mutual interest, usually in the fields of uh, countering international crime and national security. Uh, but I also met with the Attorney General of Singapore and indeed a, quite a number of other countries as well. And the Attorney has a sort of oversight role towards the attorneys of the overseas territories. And there's usually an annual conference with them, uh, usually in a Caribbean, nice Caribbean location, although I rather naughtily decided to shift it to the Falkland Islands as a, <laughs> as, 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 as in order to, uh, to provide a bit of diversity. Yes, 
Can I ask a question, which is the um, the mirror of uh, some of the points we've been discussing, which is which is this. Uh, does the Attorney General need to be a lawyer or at least one with uh, any uh, uh, in, even indirect connection to legal practice? Um, law officers have been appointed in the last 25 years or so uh, with little such connection. And I'm thinking off the top of my head of uh, Mike O'Brien, for example, who was Solicitor General, and Harriet Harman, who was also Solicitor General after long periods away from legal practice. And I think Oliver Heald, too, uh, had not been in legal practice for some time before he was appointed Solicitor General. Uh, and I wondered whether you, whether you thought, in, uh, given uh, that the role of Solicitor General, at least, has been held by people with some distance from legal practice, whether, in fact, um, uh, the requirement for law officers to be uh, uh, lawyers, albeit it's uh, lawyers in, is if in, in effect, to some extent, in, uh, in name uh, more than in practice, and whether, whether indeed, the law officers need to be uh, lawyers with that type of connection to practice? I think they do need to be lawyers. Um, I, I mean, under our constitution, I suspect they don't, because like everything else in our unwritten constitution, you could appoint somebody who is age 19 and has never studied law. <laughs> um, it can be done, and it's all right to say that when I became Attorney General in 2010, I don't suppose Edward Garnier will mind my telling this story, um, I learnt a couple of hours after um, I was appointed that um, a Prime Minister was minded to appoint as Solicitor General somebody who, although he had uh, qualified for the bar, very nice person as well, but he qualified for the bar, he had effectively never practised beyond pupilage. Um, and I went back and I said, you know, I don't think this is a very good idea because the status of the law officers will be greatly enhanced if the judiciary and the legal professions have a sense that the person in post is somebody who knows what they're doing and can demonstrate that, hopefully actually somebody who is plugged in and relatively networked. And number 10 accepted that. Um, Edward Garnier was appointed four hours later. Um, and I have to say, was an immensely <coughs> valuable colleague. Um, it's difficult to know where you draw the line. I'm, I'm not sure that, in fact, being Attorney General requires you to be a member of what I suppose some people might call the super bar. Yeah? Um, such people do exist. You could argue, for example, that Lord Goldsmith was a very distinguished lawyer at the time he became uh, Attorney General. Um, it could even be the case that sometimes people who are immensely well qualified in some particular special specialist field and become attorney general may sometimes not always see the wood for the trees. Um, and that uh, you know, there may be an advantage of having somebody who is slightly more generalist and therefore more open to listening to and getting in advice from elsewhere and forming their own view. But well, what I'm absolutely sure about is you can't do the job if you don't understand legal principles, and not just academically so, but if you don't understand it um, a, 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 in a sense of being able to practice it. And in fairness to Oliver Heald, a very valued colleague, he had practiced quite long enough to have a perfectly good grasp of what those were about. But there's somewhere in that I accept that there is a dividing line. Um, so I don't think you're necessarily looking for a barrister who is regarded as being you know, one of the top ten in the profession. I don't think that's what's needed because you also need some political nous as well. <laughs> and the two don't necessarily go together. Now, our speaker will be looking forward to a well-deserved drink fairly soon as perhaps others will be here. But can we take a couple more questions? There used to be a convention that the attorney had a right of preemption on the office of Lord Chief Justice if it fell vacant during his <laughs> term, and the solicitor had a right of preemption on a seat in the Court of Appeal if that became vacant during his term. Do you regret the fact that convention has fallen into disuse? Uh, uh, no, I don't regret the fact that that convention has fallen into disuse because my qualifications and background make me wholly unsuited to become Lord Chief Justice <laughs> or indeed to go to the Court of Appeal. Um, it is right that the last textbook written on the law officers, which came out in about 1962, suggested that this existed, but put a question mark against it. And actually, 
Uh, the only um, law officer in recent times to go to the High Court bench is Ross Cranston. Although I happen to think that that was a very good move. Um, and I certainly wouldn't rule out the possibility that um, a law officer shouldn't go onto the High Court bench. Because I think there's some value in it. Um, because there is this divide between the legal system and politicians, which is widening, partly because of the absence of senior lawyers in Parliament. And it works both ways. So actually, to have somebody like Ross go onto the bench uh, with political experience can, I think, be quite valuable. So from that point of view, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that just because you do the one, it should rule it out. I've always been very troubled by this idea that just because you've been a party politician, it means that you must have inbuilt biases which make it impossible to take objective decisions. I don't subscribe to it. Oliver Popperwell. I don't know who's here in government, but if you have any, would you like to flesh out a reference in the... <coughs> to the would you like to flesh out the reference you made to the Attorney General, Patrick Hastings, and uh, Campbell and MacDonald, which showed the conflict between lawyer and politician? It, yes. Um, P P Patrick Hastings, as I explained, was the Attorney General. Of course, in those days, it was a much more hands-on role because we didn't have the Gordon Brown Protocol. And I, the... Um, the editor of the um, uh, Daily Worker had written an article which um, suggested that soldiers should not uh, obey their officers uh, if asked to break strikes, I think was the issue. Uh, and the issue arose whether a prosecution should be brought or not. And, and Hastings acting by himself came to the conclusion that it hadn't passed the threshold but it was seized on by the press and also by the Conservatives to argue that, in fact, he had been lent on by his political colleagues. I, I, my understanding of the history, there will be others who will be more knowledgeable. But actually, I think that in reality, I, I, there is very little evidence that he had been so at all. But nevertheless, the fact that he was a member of the cabinet, which, and therefore, not just the advisor, uh, was seen as one of the sort of things with which the, the Labour government was being banged over the head. And so it led, or arguably was one of the contributory causes, which led to the fall of the Labour, then the first Labour government. And after it had gone, in fact, his immediate successors stayed in the cabinet, but there was, it raised the issue, which I, probably nobody had really considered very carefully after Rufus Isaacs had got this sort of uh, benefit of being a full cabinet minister. Um, but in 1928, and I can't remember who was, it, it, the Conservatives, I think, decided that they would not pursue it. And so the attorney reverted to being a cabinet rank minister, but not a member of the cabinet. Um, there was quite an interesting question asked of Suella Braverman, actually, which was, are you bound by collective responsibility? She said she thought she was. Um, I think if I'd been asked that question, I would have ducked it and said, I think it's irrelevant to the role that I have to perform anyway. I mean, it is true that you have got, as Attorney General, to subscribe to the policy aims of the government. Like everybody else, governments sometimes do things which you don't agree with, uh, like HS2, you know, in my case, with my constituency, but not to the point where I felt I couldn't support the government or vote for it. But you have to be able to vote for the government in the lobbies on other matters. But when it comes to providing your legal advice, you are independent, and that is what you're there to do. So you're rooting for your colleagues, you're supportive of what they're doing, supportive of the government's broad policies, and if you cease to be, well, you've got to resign. Any other questions remaining? I'm just going to abuse the chair and ask uh, whether you think it's time for an updated book on the Office of Attorney General. Well, it's funny. Six, Sixty years have uh, passed. It's <laughs> funny you should mention that because the um, uh, very, very because of my um, work doing the um, uh, the Five Eyes, I got to know some of the others, other attorneys, and there was an Attorney General of New Zealand called Chris Finlayson, very, very lovely man, 
and we became very friendly and he has the project to do such a book and wishes me to do it with him but um because of covid and one thing and another um it hasn't as yet materialized and perhaps it will never materialize but yes it does need updating uh, there's no doubt that the book, I mean, anybody who reads this book now, it, it sort of must be somewhere in the Inner Temple Library oh, on yes. the unused shelves, uh, <laughs> will we'll, we'll conclude that it, it has a distinctly archaic uh, tone to it. Thank you very much. That's well, Dominic, um, thank you very much indeed for uh, such an illuminating uh, thought. And I, I'm only just grateful not only have you managed to cross Noble Temple Lane, if you didn't have to walk up uh, uh, the road to uh, 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 Downing Street this morning, um, although some of us might regret that that was where we come. Slightly mixed, uh, mixed feelings, which you probably don't. But uh, thank you very much. You've demonstrated, I think, um, what a centre of power our Constitution is, uh, and how necessary the place of the Attorney General is in pre preserving and carrying on the gardening analogy and watering that, that flower. I can think of no better exemplar of a holder of office than yourself. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.